My name is Gary Marvin. I'm a social anthropologist interested in human animal studies, and I'm based at the University of Roehampton in southwest London. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Tom Van Duren, and to chair this keynote session. Um, although I've only met Tom personally today, sitting outside while I'm smoking, um, I've been admirer of his work since he began publishing. So I'm not, what I'm not going to do is introduce his academic background, that's in the conference um, material. I'd just like to say a couple of things, I've only got one page of notes, uh, a couple of things, as it were, about his academic foreground and his contributions to the field of what I call human animal studies. Other people might disagree with the term, but that's it. So on the author snippet on the cover of his monograph, Flightways, um, Tom is described as, or has described himself as, an environmental philosopher and anthropologist. <clears throat> and this, I think, is important. Philosopher and anthropologist. <coughs> not sure which comes first. So Tom has written about vultures, whooping cranes, little penguins, flying foxes, Hawaiian crows, and albatrosses, and I'm sure there are other creatures in there, and how their lives intersect with specific human lives. And that, for me, is the anthropology, the ethnography. But then comes his environmental philosophical engagement the response, his response to what he has set out. The philosopher Francien Despreit has said in his work an approach, Tom has a particular skill to make you hesitate with the but. I don't think you should say that. <laughs> um, and so he's, there is this, there is that, there's the ethnology, there's the anthropology, then comes the but which for me is the de his demand for an ethical, philosophical response. And for me, a central concern in Tom's recent writing and uh, the thinking and writing has been that of extinctions. At the beginning of Flightways, available outside, I think of that, <laughs> um, he sets out his position that there is no single um, extinction phenomenon, no simple loss or ending of a species, but rather each case is, in his words, quote, a distinct unraveling of ways of life, a distinctive loss, and challenges that require situated and case-specific attention. And that, for me, is firstly his ethnographic anthropological perspective, which I'm really fond of culturally specific human and other engagements. As with the specificities he demands of the anthropological, so is his concern for ethical responses. Again, he writes later in the book, a vague, sorry, I'm paraphrasing, but some sort of vague, holistic, um, ecological philosophy along the lines of, oh, everything's connected with everything else, as he said, will not get us very far. Rather, again, quoting, the specificity and proximity of connections matter, who we are bound up with and in what ways. Life and death happens in those relationships, in his words. And in his work, Tom sets out what might be or what should be our ethical responses to deep those specific lives and deaths. But this is also set within a wider um, co um, context of concerns. Again, my last quote almost from Tom, is that, in his words, how to live well with the always unequal patterns of amplified loss and suffering here in knotted multi-species worlds is an issue that can only take on increasing significance as we move ever more deeply into a sixth mass extinction and a period of growing um, environmental and climate change. So that's just my little personal anthropological take on Tom's contributions to multi species studies. But sparing his blushes, let me just end on a quick note of the range of international scholars who have expressed praise for Tom's work 
even on just on the one back cover of his book, because here we have Mark Beckoff, ecologist and evolutionary biologist, Deborah Bird, Ro uh, Rose Bird, multi species ethnographer, and sadly lost to us a few months ago, and the Singh anthropologist, Susan McHugh, critical literary theory and Vancien Desprez, ethologist and philosopher. And not surprisingly, because he's worked with her, the famous she of Santa Cruz, Donna Haraway. Um, but now, Tom, in your own words, please. Introduction. I'll try and live up to it. Um, and thank you also to, to Kari and to the uh, uh, Kent uh, Animal Humanities Network for the invitation. It's a great privilege to be able to be here today to talk to you, to share with you um, some of my current work. Um, I also want to acknowledge before I begin that um, the stories I'd like to, or stories I'll be telling tonight, arise out of the dynamic life-giving lands and seas of the Hawaiian Islands. And to pay my respects to the Kanaka Maoli, the native Hawaiian people, uh, who have been weaving their own stories into and out of these places for generations. The far out to sea, in the midst of the seemingly endless expanse of the North Pacific Ocean, an uprooted tree bobs around in the, in the water. Washed out in a storm, the tree harbors within its branches some unlikely oceanic travelers, snails. They're not sea snails or even freshwater snails. Rather, they're the snails of the forests who live amongst the, the leaves. Their arboreal home has become a canoe of sorts, a canoe that just maybe, with enough time and the right conditions, will take them to new shores, new lands and possibilities. This is the image that animates this lecture, an entirely hypothetical, speculative, and yet eminently probable oceanic voyage. The maritime animal movements that interest me here are primarily, but not entirely, ones that involve no humans at all. Movements that were likely taking place for millions of years before there were humans. But movements, and indeed lives and species, that today find themselves in peril. The story that I'd like to share with you this evening centers on the islands of Hawaii. There are very few ships in this story. Instead, the oceanic voyaging is primarily undertaken by snails traveling on, in, and with various other than human vectors. But it's equally a story that takes place on land, exploring what happened after snails arrived in these islands, how their lives have become entangled with this landscape and its people. Hawaii is, unbeknownst to most of us, including most people in Hawaii, home to one of the most diverse assemblages of terrestrial snails anywhere in the world. How did all these snails end up here, out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in one of the most remote oceanic archipelagos in the world? Snails, after all, are not commonly known for their propensity to undertake long journeys, not by land and certainly not by sea. So how did they all get here? Sadly, today the vast majority of the snails that once inhabited these islands are extinct. Most of the remaining species are thought to be heading swiftly in the same direction. There are many stories that might be told about these snails. In this time of extinction, we need multiple stories, diverse efforts to experiment and explore, to thicken and enliven the forms of life that are slipping away. This lecture is a reflection on extinction, one grounded in the captivating question of where all these disappeared and disappearing snail species came from. One grounded in the long history of their oceanic movements, arrivals and evolution in these islands. What might we learn by telling stories of unlikely mollusk voyaging, of the crossing of oceans both literal and temporal? And equally as importantly, at our present time, how might the ongoing extinctions of snails be understood differently if we pay attention to these processes? What might this context help us to see, appreciate, and perhaps even hold on to? 
But our story begins inland. The dirt track we were walking along wove its way through a rocky ridgeline on the Waianae Mountains you know, on the island of Oahu. Each side of the track was lined by an assortment of scrag and windswept plants, almost amongst them the hardy branches and the bright red blossoms of the ohia. These branches, once upon a time, would likely also have been laden with another colourful presence, that of the kahuli, the tree snails. In decades past, upland forests like this one were thick with snails. Hundreds of their brightly coloured forms might have been found clinging to the leaves of a single tree. Unlike the predominantly white and grey leaf-eating snails that are perhaps more familiar to most of us, these brightly coloured and intricately patterned kahuli would not have harmed their botanical hosts. Rather, their diet consists exclusively of a thin layer of fungi and other microbes that line the surface of the leaves. As they move across a leaf, they cling as they eat. Around the trunks of these plants, in the decomposing leaf matter, other, less con conspicuous snails would once also have roamed. Consumers of dead leaf matter, detritivores, these snails would have contributed to the health of Hawaii's forests by breaking down organic materials and releasing nutrients back into the soil. But as we walked that day through this place, we encountered none of these snails, not in the branches or among the decaying leaves. We walked through a landscape now missing most of the diverse species of mollusks that once called this place home. But we walked towards snails nonetheless. My guides were two biologists, David Sisko and Kapa'a He. More accurately, I was tagging along on one of their routine trips to one of the few places where tree snails and ground snails can still reliably be found in this mountain range. Indeed, one of the few places where these snails are now to be found in abundance anywhere in the Hawaiian Islands. After about an hour of walking up and down through the undulating and often muddy terrain, we arrived at our destination. The forest opened into a small clearing, and in front of us stood a shoulder-height green metal fence, the Palikea explosion. Encircling roughly 1,600 square metres of vegetated land, the explosion is a place of refuge for rare snails who have been rescued from surrounding forests or released from the growing captive breeding program. It's called an exclosure rather than an enclosure because its function is not primarily to keep these snails in, although it probably does this, but rather to keep others out, specifically to exclude the many predators of these snails that have arrived in these islands with their human inhabitants. Predators like rats, Jackson's chameleons, and most importantly of all, the rosy wolf snail, or the Euglandina rosea, a species of carnivorous snail that tracks and consumes the local species with incredible uh, and insidious efficiency. Keeping all of these animals out is no small feat. A complex series of barriers line the explosion walls, from a curved lip that stops the rats from getting up and over, through to a set of solar-powered wires that deliver an electric shock to any predatory snail that tries to climb the outside wall. <laughs> these explosions are a key component of the work of the Hawaii State Government Snail Extinction Prevention Program, or SEP headed up by Dave Sisko. In all, six such explosions currently exist across the island of Oahu, with plans for three more in the near future. Alongside these highly protected spaces, SEP maintains captive populations of a range of endangered species in its laboratory facility, a large trailer fitted out with six environmental chambers that simulate ideal conditions for their inhabitants. But these facilities can only protect a fraction of Hawaii snails. The Hawaiian Islands <coughs> were once home to an incredible 800, roughly 800 species of terrestrial snails. Today, an estimated 65 to 90 percent of these species are thought to already be extinct, depending on the taxonomic family in question, with most of the remaining species seriously threatened. While steady rates of extinction are thought to have been taking place since the arrival of Polynesian peoples in these islands, things have been drastically scaled up in the last century. While predation is today the primary cause of their troubles, other impacts, including shell collecting, 
which is no longer really an issue, <coughs> and forest clearing, especially for agriculture, ranching, urban development, or, and even the live fire operations of the US military have all played a role in these declines. Getting a precise handle on the snail situation in Hawaii is a truly difficult task. The simple fact is that we just don't know how bad things are, at least in ways that can be readily quantified. We don't know for certain how many snail species there are or were in the islands, let alone the current conservation status of those that remain. The situation is significantly different to dealing with endangered birds or mammals where species tend to be thought about and managed individually or in small groups. In the world of Hawaii snails, endangered species conservation must take place in bulk. It must deal with hundreds of species of tiny animals identifiable only to specialists and possessing only a Latin name, and most of them relatively little studied until recently. As a result, scientists generally lack the kind of data necessary to formally list some of these species, even some of the most threatened ones under the US Endangered Species Act. Across the island chain, a mere 13 species are listed and protected in this way, and they're all amongst the more conspicuous, larger, bright, brightly colored tree snails. In short, this is a space simultaneously of profound uncertainty and urgency, a deeply difficult space to occupy if you care about the future of snails. Ultimately, however, conservation efforts are at best a stopgap measure. As David Sisko explained to me, restoration of these species is just not possible at the moment. Extinction prevention is the best that we can hope for. All over the island of Oahu and beyond where resources allow, David and his team are engaged in what he thinks about as an evacuation, trying desperately to locate the last remnants of snail species. Just a few years ago, they would try to take only a small number of snails from these populations as a backup, leaving the rest in the forest. In the intervening years, however, that they've seen about 15 formerly robust populations, each comprised of hundreds of snails, disappear completely. Some, like that of Akatanella lila, were the last known free-living populations of their species. As a result, David and his team are now often pulling every snail they can find out of the forest, carefully packing them into containers and bringing them into the lab or an exclosure if they can find room for them. As I stood in the Palikea exposure on the day of my visit, it was these issues of extinction and loss that preoccupied me. But I had another, another interest too. Standing amongst one particularly nice cluster of about 15 critically endangered Acatinella mustelina, their vibrant white shells in the leaves all around me, I took the opportunity to listen. Listening isn't something that one ordinarily does with snails, but in this case I did so because it said that the kahuli sings in the forest. In fact, another Hawaiian name for these snails is pupu kaniroi, literally translating as shell sounding long. This singing is one of the strongest and most consistent themes associated with snails in Kanaka Maoli or native Hawaiian mele oli and mo'olelo, songs, chants, and stories. It isn't clear what form this singing might take. It's described by some as beautiful, Others told me it was a single high-pitched note. In the text where it's mentioned, the singing of Kahuli is deeply meaningful, often occurring as a sign that after a series of adventures, changes, or turbulence, all is pono again, all is righteous, correct, and good. But while I listened to the singing that day, I heard no song. Perhaps as many biologists I asked about this phenomenon told me, that's because snails can't sing. <laughs> Perhaps it was because it was daytime and snails only sing at night when they're more active. Well, perhaps they did not sing that day and don't sing much at all, if much at all anymore, because everything is a long, long way from being right in the world. These are some of the less photogenic snails. So in 2006, the biologist Brendan Holland placed a piece of tree bark with 12 live Hawaiian land snails of the species Succinia caduca into a saltwater aquarium. This is one of Hawaii's non-endangered snail species, which is important because the purpose of this experiment was to see whether they would survive. 
The snails that Brendan enlisted into this experiment were from populations living as little as 10 metres from the beach. Snails that might readily get caught in the runoff of a heavy storm and washed out to sea. Brendan's purpose, of course, was not simply to understand their prospects for survival were this to happen, but rather to determine whether it might be possible for these kinds of events to play a role in the dispersal of snail species to new lands. The answer, it seems, is yes. Brendan and his colleague Rob Cowie later reported that after 12 hours of immersion, all species were alive, indicating that seawater is not immediately lethal and suggesting the potential for rafting between islands on logs and vegetation. This is the only experiment to date that's explored these questions in relation to Hawaii snails. Well beyond Hawaii shores, however, land snails have long been something of a puzzle in the effort to understand the evolution and distribution of species. Terrestrial snails are generally a pretty sedentary bunch, spending their lives close to the spot they happen to be hatched or born onto. When we add to this situation their very low tolerance for seawater, as they have no control over their salt absorption and thus dehydrate readily, the diverse range of snail species found on remote oceanic islands like Hawaii becomes even more confounding. And yet terrestrial snails are to be found on pretty much every tropical and subtropical island around the world. We're faced then with a kind of snail paradox, as Brendan put it to me in an interview. How do organisms that are so sedentary end up being so incredibly widely dispersed? Charles Darwin, along with many others, before and since pondered this question. In a letter to Alfred Russell Wallace in 1857, Darwin summed the situation up succinctly. One of the subjects on which I have been experimentizing and which cost me much trouble is the means of distribution of all organic beings found on oceanic islands. And any facts on this subject would be most <coughs> gratefully received. Land mollusks are a great perplexity to me. In an effort to address this perplexity, Darwin submerged snails in salt water to explore whether and for how long they might survive. Amongst his other experiments, amongst his other findings was the fact that dormant or estivating snails of the species Helix pomatia, common, a common garden snail, recovered after 20 days in seawater. This dormancy is important. When many species of snails are estivating, they can form an epiphram which is essentially a temporary cover of mucus that's used to seal their opening or aperture to prevent them from drying out. This is the reason why snails are sometimes hard to pull off uh, an object in the garden. As long as they are sealed up inside their shells, many snails can survive submerged in salt water for weeks at a time. Inspired by Darwin, a French study in the 1860s placed 100 land snails of 10 different species in a box with holes and immersed it in seawater. Roughly a quarter of the snails from six different species survived for 14 days, which was calculated to be about half the time it would take for an object like a log to float across the Atlantic. All of these diverse years of, uh, diverse, uh, all of, all of these years of submerging snails of land mollusks drowned and survived have produced one primary, albeit tentative, finding. It's at least possible that land snails are floating around the world to establish themselves in far-flung places. We just don't know enough about Hawaii snails in this regard to know how likely a vector this is for their movements. We have a single short-term study of one of around 800 known species. Of course, the conditions for these kinds of studies no longer really exist in Hawaii. But floating is also by no means the only mode of transport open to snails. In fact, most of the biologists I've interviewed on the topic are of the view that it probably isn't even the primary way in which snails have moved across large distances. While snails have likely floated around within the Hawaiian archipelago, between islands, it's thought to be unlikely that the first land snails made their way to Hawaii in this way. The distance of open ocean is just too vast. Here things get even stranger though, and even less amenable to experimentation. Most scientists think the most likely explanation is that the first snails travelled to Hawaii by bird. This is, is a suggestion that is pretty hard to swallow when we look at many of Hawaii snails in their current form. 
For this reason, Brendan suggested that we make a trip to Mount Tantalus on the outskirts of Honolulu. There, amongst the vegetation, he introduced me to a host of tiny snags, somehow still managing to survive in the thick of predators. Brendan explained that one of these species, Auricula diaphana, is a close relative of the much larger snails of the genus Acatonella that I have encountered in the Palikea exclosure. The former are about two millimetres in length, the latter about two centimetres. This relatedness matters. If the ancestors of the larger Acatonella snails were tiny creatures like their relatives, only undergoing island gigantism, relatively speaking, of course, after generations of life on Oahu, then their tiny ancestors might have had other modes of transportation open to them. These tiny ancestors might have climbed on board a migratory bird as it perched or nested overnight. Snails, after all, are nocturnal. The snail might have then hunkered down deep in the bird's feathers, only climbing off once they had arrived safely at their destination. While for some species, this transport might have taken place via their sticky egg clusters, other species, like the larger tree snails, give birth to live young. If this was also the case for their ancestors, which is thought to have been, then they would have to have made this journey on a bird in a living form. This is a proposal that I must admit I was quite dubious about, until I saw the, form, the tiny forms of auricular diaphana. <clears throat> While it still seems horribly unlikely that this sequence of events would ever take place, in the fullness of evolutionary time, those are actually pretty good odds. Alongside these two possible vectors of travel, there are other others, especially for shorter inter-island trips. Some snails may have traveled inside birds. Recent studies have shown that a variety of land snails around the world survive passage through avian digestive tracts at relatively high rates. Other snails might have flown on leaves or debris high in the airstream. These are undoubtedly all rather unreliable ways to travel. For every snail that successfully arrived in a strange new land on a bird or floating on a branch or log, countless millions must have been washed, blown or flown out to sea without such luck. The odds must be slightly better travelling by bird than by log. At least in theory, if you hop onto a migratory bird in a forest, you're quite likely to be taken to another forest. Snails are largely at the whim of external forces in these movements, subject to what biologists call passive dispersal. As Brendan helpfully summed it up for me, biogeographically, snails are plants. Both groups sharing many of the same vectors for movement, the latter usually by sea or spore. This is clearly a system of island dispersal that can only hope to achieve results with immense periods of time at its disposal. Over millions of years, a few lucky snails made these journeys successfully. We really can't know for certain how many times this happened in the history of the Hawaiian Islands. Genetic studies indicate, though, that some family groups arrived and established themselves on more than one occasion. An absolute minimum, though, in order to have ended up with the diversity of snails that are, are there in the islands, things must have worked out for around 19 intrepid travellers over roughly the past five million years. This means that the vast majority of Hawaii's 800 odd snail species evolved in the islands from a relatively small number of common ancestors. So while snails certainly have many things working against them in their travels, the simple fact that they're found on islands almost <coughs> everywhere tells us that despite appearances, they're actually very good at dispersing across oceans. While they might not fly or enjoy salt water, they're small and robust enough to seal up and take advantage of other modes of movement. Some of them even have sticky egg clusters that are readily caught up on unsuspecting passers-by. But these snails have another dispersal advantage over many other animals that only really becomes apparent after arrival, a reproductive advantage. Hawaii's land snails, like others around the world, are all hermaphrodites. This means that for successful establishment in a new land to take place, any two individuals will do. In fact, in some cases, one might be enough. Some snails seem to be capable of selfing or self-fertilization, and others seem to be able to store sperm from copulation for long periods of time to use at a later date. 
There's clearly something very passive about this dispersal of snails around the world, always at the whim of others, be they birds, storms or tides. But this also isn't the whole of the story. These modes of passive work because snails have evolved some pretty remarkable traits that enable dispersal, survival and reproduction across and into isolated new lands. From sticky eggs and epiphrams to hermaphroditism and sperm storage. There's a profound kind of evolutionary agency at work here, a creative, experimental, adaptive working out of living forms with particular capacities and propensities. As such, we must remember that this passivity is not simply a matter of snails doing nothing, although it certainly involves a fair bit of that. At the same time, it's made possible by the particularity of snail forms of life, which themselves emerge out of long histories of evolution, of lives lived, journeys undertaken more or less successfully. In short, this highly successful passivity is a remarkable evolutionary achievement. There's so much more to learn here, so much to learn about the processes that have given rise to these gastropod forms of life that are so oddly suited to islands. So much to learn about not just the vectors, but the patterns under which snail movements take place. Are they perhaps laid down by atmospheric and oceanic currents, or by the paths of avian migration? And yet, to some extent, this must remain a space of uncertainty and even mystery. How can one really study processes of biogeography that take place across such vast periods of time and space? As Brendan reminded me, it's likely that in the history of these islands, on average, one successful snail arrival has taken place roughly every 300,000 years. Put simply, it's not something that any of us are likely to ever see, let alone study firsthand. Each new drawer that we opened revealed another set of wonders, another surprising colour or variation in shape or size. In one drawer we encountered the cone shells of Corelia, Corelia terricula, a now extinct ground dwelling snail that's thought to have once been the largest in the Hawaiian Islands. In another drawer the tiny, delicate, translucent forms of Succinia lumbalis. In many others, we found the glossy, colourful forms of Acatinella snails, some with bands and stripes, others with patterns in ways reminiscent of tweed or tortoise shell. Drawer after drawer, cabinet after cabinet, row after row, encountering shells of all shapes and sizes, we moved through the malacology collection of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, ultimately only seeing a tiny part of the collection. My guide was Nori Jung, researcher and manager of this incredible collection of roughly 4 million Pacific Island snail shells, the largest of its kind in the world. While some of this collecting was done by museum staff, the vast majority of these shells were donated to the museum by private collectors or their families. This collection is largely the product of a European and American collecting craze in the late 19th and 20th centuries what some locals of the time referred to as land shell fever. There's no doubt that these collecting practices had a significant impact on Hawaii snails, perhaps even causing the extinction of some species with restricted ranges. As Nori and I moved through the collection on the day of my visit, we discussed the incredible diversity of the island's land snails. In all, 752 species have been described to date, most of them sadly already extinct. This is or was one of the most diverse assemblages of snails anywhere on Earth. To put this in some sort of context, Hawaii has two-thirds of the number of snail species that are found in the whole of North America, a landmass roughly 1,700 times the size. But as we're seeing, the vast majority of Hawaii's snail species did not make the journey across the ocean to be there. Rather, they evolved in the islands, single arrival events giving rise to one new species and then another and then another as populations separated and diverged. As such, most of these snail species were found living only in this island chain. In fact, almost all of the larger species are what biologists or were what biologists call single island endemics, found only on one island and in many cases only on a single mountain range or within that range on a single volcano or valley. <coughs> 
But why did so many different species evolve in these tiny areas of land? In no small way, it was the Hawaiian Islands themselves that produced the conditions for this incredible diversity. They did so through the relatively ideal environment they provide, plenty of moist, entirely or largely predator-free forests. As on islands elsewhere, snails in Hawaii were also able to adapt to take up roles or ecological niches that are often filled by other species on continental land masses. For example, in the absence of earthworms and other detritivores who specialise in breaking down leaf matter, snails took up this work in Hawaii. Alongside these adaptive possibilities, the Hawaiian Islands also offered plenty of opportunities for the kind of separation and isolation that allows populations to simply drift apart into different species. In some cases, a snail might be blown or float on a log to another part of an island or to an entirely different island. In other cases, physical barriers opened up within existing populations. For example, as deep valleys were eroded out of volcanic mountain chains, creating warmer and drier barrier zones that are less hospitable to snails. In many respects, the Hawaiian Islands offer an ideal environment for this kind of snail speciation. Their lands, these are landscapes of incredible ecological diversity and patchiness, providing defined borders across which snails cannot actively pass. Unlike animals like birds that are highly mobile and can spread across an island into all of the suitable habitat, snails rely on occasional dispersal across barriers by chance events. This means the snail populations, once separated, are unlikely to reconnect over hundreds of thousands of years. This kind of isolation creates ideal conditions for populations to simply wander off in different evolutionary directions, giving rise to one or more new species in each locale. The curator removed a small box about the size of a dinner plate from the cabinet, walked over to the bench and placed it down. Inside two delicately interwoven strands of kahuli shells, all of the genus Acatonella combined to form a stunning lay. I was in another part of the Bishop Museum, the Ethological Collection, this time to see the one and only lay that they hold that is comprised entirely of terrestrial Hawaiian snail shells. This lay is also distinguished by its former owner, Queen Lilio Kalani, who was the last monarch of Hawaii, the government overthrown in 1893 by a group of mostly American citizens residing in the islands with the assistance of the US Marines. Little is known for certain about this lay, how, why, or when Lilio Kalani acquired it. In fact, while lay made from marine snail shells are very common in Hawaii, the shells of forest snails seem to have been far less frequently used in this way. This lay, however, reminds us that the lives of the Hawaiian people, the Kanakamaoli, have long been tangled up with snails. Their shells were used to adorn the bodies of hula dancers and their kua, or altars. According to occasional references in the literature, some larger snails may also have been eaten by people, either raw or cooked inside the leaves of the tea plant. But perhaps more importantly than any of these kinds of uses, snails were potent symbols or omens in people's lives and stories often indicating positive and righteous action and circumstances. This is, as we've seen, something that the stories tell us snails did most powerfully through their singing. People that I spoke to in Hawaii had a range of ideas about this singing, most of them referencing the lack of vocal cords, thought that snails do not sing, and offered one of two explanations for these stories. In the first case, it was said that this notion of singing was metaphorical, referring to the whistling sound that might be made as the wind rushed over the aperture of a snail shell as it hung from a leaf or a branch. In centuries past, when the forest was thick with snails, this sound might have combined to produce a melody of sorts. Others felt that this was extremely unlikely. The biologist Mike Hadfield told me that these shells were just too small. What's more, snails tend to assiduously keep their apertures covered. As Mike put it, no self-respecting snail will give up its moisture by sitting there gaping into the wind. <laughs> a second possible explanation for these stories of singing that I heard from several people was expressed most eloquently by Sam Ogden, <coughs> an ecologist and kumu oli, or teacher of chants. Sam pointed out to me that Hawaiians were and are extremely observant people, 
But in this case, he thinks that perhaps the chirping of crickets might have been associated with a much more readily visible kahuli. He asked me to imagine visiting a dark forest at night with only the light of a sputtering torch to guide the way. You'd be surrounded by the sound of high-pitched singing because in Hawaii there are hundreds of species of crickets. But he pointed out to me, as you approach the crickets, they become quiet and move away. In his words, you come over with your torch and you want to see what's making that sound. You turn over the leaves and the crickets have long since jumped away. But there are snails sitting there under the leaves. Beautiful snails, no less. It would be very easy to associate that singing, whistling sound with those snails. And you've disturbed them. So, of course, if you put your ear to them, you're not going to hear a thing. It's only when you put the leaves back and sit quietly for a minute that the singing begins again. As Kanaka Māori learned about and made themselves at home in these islands, they didn't only interact with the species of snails that were there prior to their arrival. They also brought snails of their own. Since the voyage in canoes of the first Polynesian settlers ran ashore, people have acted as a conduit for snail movements to these islands. It's now well known that Polynesian peoples travelled with an assortment of animals and plants, from pigs to kalo and paper mulberry. These canoe species formed the basis of, for Kanaka Māori life, for food and medicine, for cosmology and cultural and religious practices. But what's less well known, or at least less often discussed, are all of those other species that travel along with these plants and animals, some of them unseen and unintended. Amongst their number were a handful of snails. Recent archaeological research suggests that a few Hawaiian species are likely candidates for Polynesian introduction. All of these species are small and inconspicuous, often found living on and around canoe plants. The kinds of snails that might easily have hitched a ride on a Polynesian canoe. In other parts of the Pacific, it seems likely that people intentionally moved larger, culturally significant tree snails, deliberately establishing them on their new island homes. When I asked the biologist Carl Christensen about the logistics of this kind of movement, he replied, it would be that difficult. A lot of snails can shut down physiologically. For the few weeks that it's going to take for you to sail from Tahiti to the Cooks, I don't think there's any problem at all. You just put the snails out of the sun so they're not going to overheat, and they'd be able to last. Here we encounter yet another important adaptation for travel, another facet of the story of the prodigious transoceanic journey of these seemingly most sedentary of animals. Through their actions intended and unintended, People here join birds, branches, and waves to become another vector in the unfolding biogeographical story of the snails of Hawaii. Importantly, however, these particular people offered a distinctive kind of movement. Contrary to the stories long told about Polynesian travels, stories in which, as the missionary Hiram Bingham once put it, <coughs> these people arrived without much knowledge of navigation, just as trees from foreign countries repeatedly land on the shore. Contrary to those stories, it's now very clear that these journeys were made possible by the skill and knowledge of some of history's most successful oceanic voyages. As the Maori scholar Alistair Pumi Somerville has put it, discussing Polynesian and Pacific voyaging more generally, this was an unparalleled and unparalleled feat of navigation and curiosity. And so from a snail's perspective, to set off on a Polynesian canoe was most likely to be taken to another site, a relatively suitable habitat. Standing within the Palikea exposure on the day of my visit, encircled by a fence fitted with layers of barriers, itself surrounded by a moat of cleared land, it was hard to fail to appreciate how profoundly fractured and isolated the lives and possibilities of Hawaii snails have become. This situation is perhaps exemplified in the story of one specific occupant of the exposure, a master Spirizona. This striking species with a bluish conical shell about 1.5 centimetres in length is now thought to be found nowhere else. The last 30 or so individuals were brought into the exclosure and placed within a large wooden box with wire mesh on one side. The box keeps them together to ensure that a core breeding population can find each other to reproduce, while also allowing the smaller juvenile snails to disperse through the mesh into the exclosure beyond. Happily, this is exactly what has been happening. The current population is now about 150 snails. 
And so here these snails reside in a box behind a fence. While Amastra spirizona is no doubt an extreme case, the sad reality is that many of Hawaii snails can only survive in tiny, isolated pockets of space like this. From the captive populations in the lab through to the various spaces of the explosion. In short, they can only survive cut off from the environments, processes, and relationships that birth them. Environments that once produced the conditions not only for survival, but for an incredible radiation of diversity have now become lethal. As I stood in the presence of these snails in the Palikea exposure, I remembered a conversation earlier that week with Puakea Nobelmai, an expert in Hawaiian language and culture. When I asked Puakea about the traditional stories and ideas about snails singing, he replied with a story of his own. Many years earlier, Auntie Edith Kanakaole, a renowned composer and kumu hula, teacher of hula, told Puakea and a group of her chant students that scientists had taken it to her to their lab to explain how impossible it was biologically for snails to sing. He continued, Auntie Edith's take on that was, isn't that sad? They won't sing <laughs> <laughs> Auntie Edith's understanding draws us into another space of uncertainty or mystery in the unfolding story of these snails. She reminds us that the world and other living beings and the other living beings that comprise it are not objects transparent to our gaze, readily revealed. Each of us, scientist, kumu hula, philosopher, snail, knows one another, knows the world from the inside. Which is to say that each of us only ever knows the world in a partial way. Much will always remain, much must always remain, unknowable, or simply knowable in other ways. The anthropologist Deborah Bird Rose tells us that this kind of mystery is a feature of all holistic systems. As she put it, one cannot remove oneself from the system under examination. And because one is part of the system, the whole remains outside the possibility of one's comprehension. But Rose insists this mystery is a cause for celebration. It's something to be respected, cherished, guarded even. Mystery signals the complexity and integrity of larger systems. A world that is entirely knowable is a dead or dying one. Rose went on to say, total predictability would signal crisis, loss of connection, loss of the larger system. From this perspective, mystery is inseparable from the vitality of the living world. This is by no means a celebration of ignorance, but rather a humble acknowledgement of the many layers and possibilities of our shared world. For as long as they or we endure, Hawaii snails will continue to draw us into worlds of uncertainty and indeed mystery. These spaces of not knowing might reside in the one or many vectors by which these snails arrive in the islands, or perhaps in the relation to the way in which they might sing and make meaning in the forest. These spaces of not knowing cannot really be lost in any absolute sense, but the possibility of our living well with them most certainly can. The possibility of inhabiting the world in a spirit of respectful curiosity, humility and wonder. As Hawaii's many incredible snail species slip away one by one, and as the worlds of those that manage to survive become increasingly fractured and simplified, we undermine our ability to find ways to relate to and value a world that is much bigger and more complex than we can know. We undermine the possibility of looking at a snail shell and seeing a mystery that can never be uncoiled, but that must rather simply be lived with, questioned, explored, wondered about, chanted, danced, and sung with, but ultimately always to remain at least partly unknown. Snails are just one way, or rather, one constellation of ways into a sensible world that exceeds us. None of the snails I encountered in Hawaii sang in my presence. Or if they did, I was unable to hear them. But thinking carefully with and about snails nonetheless drew me into new understandings, new modes of appreciation and respect. For me at least, the immense biogeographical and evolutionary stories coiled in their tiny shells provided a potent portal into a, into a world of incredible scope and complexity, of exciting understanding alongside ongoing and profound mystery. It's hard to really make sense of this 
vast assemblage of Hawaiian snail life. I imagine it's something like a giant network with strands stretching out across the Pacific Ocean and beyond, stretching back over evolutionary and geological time frames. Each strand represents one of hundreds of unique species, millions of years of unlikely journeys nestled into a bird's feathers or perhaps tucked away amongst the plant's leaves, heading to destinations unknown. Millions of years of intergenerational agency that produced these intrepid, even if somewhat unlikely, island disperses with their reproductive and other adaptations that make these movements possible. And then, after that most fortuitous of arrivals, countless generations more of chance movements giving rise to speciation through isolation. Each strand is a unique line of movement, of relationships, of branching transformations.